Hello and welcome to Bar 10 Test Prep, where we prepare you for the bar exam 10 questions at a time. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell so that you can be updated every time we upload new content. Question number one. Neighbor who lived next door to homeowner went into homeowner's garage without permission and borrowed homeowner's chainsaw. Neighbor used a saw to clear broken branches from the trees on neighbor's own property. After he'd finished, neighbor noticed several broken branches on homeowner's trees that were in danger of falling onto homeowner's roof. While neighbor was cutting homeowner's branches, the saw broke. In a suit for conversion by the homeowner against neighbor, will, owner, will, will homeowner recover? A. Yes, for the actual damages to the saw. B. Yes, for the value of the saw before neighbor borrowed it. C. No, because when the saw broke, neighbor was using it to benefit homeowner. And D, no, because neighbor did not intend to keep the saw. Take 10 seconds and let's see if you can choose the best option. The best choice here is B, yes, for the value of the saw before neighbor borrowed it. The remedies available for conversion are either damages or replevin. For damages, the defendant is required to pay the victim the fair market value of the chattels at the time of the conversion, but the defendant keeps the property. In this case, the neighbor borrowed the homeowner's saw without permission, i.e. the conversion, but the saw broke while the neighbor was cutting homeowner's branches. Since the saw is broken, homeowner would not be interested in regaining possession of that saw, i.e. replevant. And as such, homeowner would recover the value of the saw before the neighbor borrowed it. Let's move on to question number two. Joe and Marty were co-workers. Joe admired Marty's wristwatch and frequently said how much he wished he had one like it. Marty decided to give Joe the watch for his birthday the following week. On the weekend before Joe's birthday, Joe and Marty attended a company picnic. Marty took his watch off and left it on a blanket. When he went off to join in a touch football game, Joe strode by, saw the watch on the blanket, and decided to steal it. He bent over and picked up the watch before he could pocket it. However, Marty returned. When he saw Joe holding the watch, he said, Joe, I know how much you like that watch. I was planning to give it to you for your birthday. Go ahead and take it now. Joe kept the watch. Joe has committed which crime, if any? A. Larceny. B. Attempted larceny. C. Embezzlement. D. No crime. See if you can figure this one out in 10 seconds. The correct answer is A, larceny. Larceny is the wrongful taking and carrying away of another's tangible personal property without consent and with the intent to permanently deprive. The intent to permanently deprive must be present at the time of the taking. Remember, this is the concurrence requirement. Here in this scenario, the watch was picked up already. Obviously, at that juncture, the individual had the intent to deprive the other of the wristwatch. So as a result... Even though it ended that he received the watch as a gift, technically at that juncture he had in fact committed a larceny. Question number three. Water District is an independent municipal water supply district incorporated under the applicable laws of the state of Green. The district was created solely to supply water to an entirely new community in a recently developed area of Green. That new community is racially, ethnically, and socioeconomically diverse and the community has never engaged in any discrimination against members of minority groups. The five-member elected governing board of the newly created water district contained two persons who are members of racially minority groups. At its first meeting, the governing board of the water district ad adopted a rule unqualified, unqualifiedly setting aside 25% of all positions on the staff of the district and 25% of all contracts to be awarded by the district to members of racial minority groups. The purpose of the rule was to help redress the historical discrimination against these groups in this country and to help them achieve economic parity with other groups in our society. Assume that no federal statute applies. A suit by appropriate parties challenges the constitutionality of these set-asides. In this suit, the most appropriate ruling on the basis of applicable U.S. Supreme Court precedent would be that the set-asides set are A. Unconstitutional, 
because they would deny other potential employees or potential contractors the equal protection of the laws, b unconstitutional because they would permissibly impair the right to contract of other potential employees or potential contractors, c constitutional because they would assure members of racial minority groups the equal protection of the laws, or d constitutional because the function and activities of water district are of a proprietary nature rather than a gov governmental nature, and therefore are not subject to the usual requirements of the 14th Amendment. Take 10 seconds and give some thought to which is the best option. If you chose A, unconstitutional, because they would deny other potential employees or potential contractors the equal protection of the laws, you'd be correct. The general rule is that racial classification that benefit minorities are permitted to remedy past discrimination, i.e. remedying past discrimination is a compelling government interest. But numerical set-asides require clear proof of past discrimination. In this case, there's no clear proof of past discrimination. Instead, there's only a generalized claim of past discrimination by the entire country. Instead, we have the facts that actually, in fact, tell us that this particular state has never had any issue. This particular water board has never had any issue. So it would seem that the set-asides would be inappropriate given those circumstances. Let's move on to question number four. Polko sued Davidson, its former vice president, for return of $230,000 that had been embezzled during the previous two years. Called by Polko as an adverse witness, Davidson testified that his annual salary had been $75,000, and he denied the embezzlement. Polko calls banker Witt to show that during the two-year period, Davidson had deposited $250,000 in his bank account. Witt's testimony is A. Admissible as circumstantial evidence of Davidson's guilt. B. Admissible to impeach Davidson. C. Inadmissible because its prejudicial effect substantially outweighs its probative value. Or D. Inadmissible because the deposits could have come from legitimate sources. Take 10 seconds and see if you can choose what the best option is. The best option would be A, admissible as circumstantial evidence of Davidson's guilt. Circumstantial evidence requires an inference to prove a fact. Circumstantial evidence may be admissible if it is relevant, i.e., any evidence that has a tendency to make the existence of any fact that is of consequence to the determination of the action more or less probable than it would without the evidence. And, of course, if its probative value outweighs unfair prejudice. In this case, Wood's testimony shows Davidson had deposited $250,000 over the two-year period where the embezzlement actually, in fact, occurred. This is circumstantial evidence of Davidson embezzling the $230,000 in question, because Wood's testimony by itself does not prove Davidson's liability, but a person can infer that such a large amount deposited may have come from the alleged embezzlement, since it is not accounted for by Davidson's $75,000 annual salary. This evidence certainly makes the existence of Davidson's alleged embezzlement more probable, and the probative value of such evidence outweighs any unfair prejudice to Davidson. Therefore, Witt's testimony is admissible as circumstantial evidence of Davidson's guilt. Question number five. Olivia, owner in fee simple of Richacre, a large parcel of vacant land, executed a deed purporting to convey Richacre to her nephew, Grant. She told Grant, who was then 19, about the deed and said that she would give it to him when he reached 21 and had received his undergraduate college degree. Shortly afterward, Grant searched Olivia's desk, found and removed the deed, and recorded it. A month later, Grant executed an instrument in the proper form of a warranty deed purporting to convey Rich Acre to his fiance, Bonnie. He delivered the deed to Bonnie, pointing out that the deed recited that it was given in exchange for one dollar and the other good and valuable consideration and that to make it valid, Bonnie must pay him one dollar. Bonnie impressed and, grateful, and gratefully did so. Together, they went to the recording office and recorded the deed. Bonnie assumed Grant had owned Rich Acre and knew nothing about Grant's dealing with Olivia. Neither Olivia's deed to Grant nor Grant's deed to Bonnie said anything about any conditions. The Recording Act of the Jurisdiction provides 
no conveyance or mortgage of real property shall be good against subsequent purchasers for value and without notice unless the same be recorded according to law. Two years passed. Grant turned 21, then graduated from college. At the graduation party, Olivia was chatting with Bonnie and for the first time learned the foregoing facts. The age of a majority in the jurisdiction is 18. Olivia bought an appropriate action against Bonnie to quiet title to Rich Acre. The court will decide for A. Olivia, because Grant's deed to Bonnie before Grant satisfied Olivia's conditions was void, as Bonnie had paid only nominal consideration. B. Olivia, because her deed to Grant was not delivered. C. Bonnie, because Grant has satisfied Olivia's oral conditions. D. Bonnie, because the deed to her was recorded. Take 10 seconds and choose what you think is the best option. If you chose B, Olivia, because her deed to Grant was not delivered, you'd be correct. The rule is that a deed is not effective to transfer title until it's been delivered by the grantor. Delivery requires words or conduct evidencing a grantor's intention that the deed have some present operative value. Here, since the deed was never delivered to Grant, Grant's subsequent conveyance to Bonnie is void and will be set aside even if the property has passed to a bona fide purchaser. Question number six. Homeowner hired arsonist to set fire to homeowner's house so that homeowner could collect the insurance proceeds from the fire. After pouring gasoline around the house, arsonist lit lit the fire with his cigarette lighter and then put the lighter in his pocket. As arsonist was standing back admiring his work, the lighter exploded in his pocket. Arsonist suffered severe burns to his leg. Arsonist brought an action against the manufacturer of the lighter based on strict product liability. Under applicable law, the rules of pure comparative fault apply in such actions. Will arsonist prevail? A. Yes, if the lighter exploded because of a defect caused by a manufacturing error. B. Yes, if arsonist can establish that the lighter was the proximate cause of his injury. C. No, because the lighter was not being used for an intended or reasonably foreseeable purpose. Or D. No, because arsonist was injured in the course of committing a felony by the evidence used to perpetrate the felony. Take 10 seconds and choose what you think is the best option. The best option is A. Yes, if the lighter exploded because of a defect caused by a manufacturing error. Products liability is strict liability for defective products. Remember, there are other theories of products liability, such as intent, negligence, implied warranties, and express warranties. But strict liability is the easiest for a plaintiff to prove. The general rule is that a seller of a product is strictly liable for injuries caused by defective products. The elements for strict products liability are 1. Merchant, 2. Defect in product, and 3. Actual cause, 4. Intended use or reasonably foreseeable misuse. A manufacturing defect exists when the product failed to perform as safely as an ordinary consumer would expect. Actual cause is presumed if the product went through the ordinary channels of commerce, but can also be inferred through res ipsa loquitur. Under the theory of res ipsa loquitur, it may be inferred that the harm sustained by the plaintiff was caused by a product defect existing at the time of sale or distribution without proof of a specific defect. When the incident that harmed the plaintiff was of a kind that ordinarily occurs as a result of a product defect and was not, in the particular case, solely the result of causes other than the product defect existing at the time of the sale or distribution. In this case, arsonist used his cigarette lighter to light a fire, i.e. intended use, and then placed the lighter in his pocket where it exploded. Clearly, an ordinary consumer would not expect the lighter to explode, so this is a manufacturing defect. Arsonist will satisfy the element of actual cause by using the theory of res ipsa loquitur, i.e. the incident that harmed the plaintiff was of a kind that ordinarily occurs as a result of a product defect. As such, arsonist will prevail because the lighter exploded due to a defect caused by the manufacturing. Let's look at number seven. State enacted a statute to regulate administratively the conduct of motor vehicle junkyard businesses in order to deter motor vehicle theft and trafficking in stolen motor vehicles or parts thereof. The statute requires a junkyard owner or operator to permit representatives of the Department of Motor Vehicles or any 
law enforcement agency upon request during normal business hours to take physical inventory of motor vehicle and parts thereof on the premises. The statute also states that a failure to comply with any of its requirements constitutes a felony. Police officers assigned to Magnolia City's Automobile automobile Crimes Unit periodically visited all, all motor vehicle junkyards in town to make the inspections permitted by the statute. Janet owns such a business in Magnolia City. One summer day, the officers asked to inspect the vehicles on her lot. Her lot. Janet said, do I have a choice? The officers told her she did not. The officers conducted their inspection and discovered three stolen automobiles. Janet is charged with receiving stolen property. Janet moves pretrial to suppress the evidence relating to the three automobiles on the grounds that the inspection was unconstitutional. Her motion should be A, sustained because the statute grants unbridled discretion to law enforcement officers to make warrantless searches, B, sustained because the state the stated regulatory purposes of the statute is a pretext to circumvent the warrant requirement in conducting criminal investigations. C. Denied because the statute deals reasonably with a highly regulated industry. And D. Denied because administrative searches of commercial establishment do not require warrants. Take 10 seconds and see if you can tell us what you think the best response is. The best answer is C, denied, because the statute deals reasonably with a highly regulated industry. The general rule is that inspectors must have a warrant for searches of private residences and commercial buildings. The probable cause required for administrative search warrants is lower than that required for other search warrants. Nevertheless, search, searches of businesses with a, within a highly regulated industry are permitted without a warrant. In this case, State X enacted a statute to regulate administratively the conduct of motor vehicle junkyard businesses in order to deter motor vehicle theft and trafficking in stolen motor vehicle or parts there's all. Since this statute authorizes warrantless searches of businesses within a highly regulated industry, Janet's motion to suppress the evidence relating to the three automobiles on the grounds that the inspection was unconstitutional should properly be denied. Let's move on to question number eight. On July 15th, in a writing signed by both parties, Fixtures Inc., agreed to deliver to Druggist on August 15th five storage cabinets from inventory for a total price of $5,000 to be paid on delivery. On August 1st, the two parties orally agreed to postpone the delivery date to August 20th. On August 20th, fixtures tendered the cabinets to Druggist, who refused to accept or pay for them on the ground that they were not tendered on August 15th, even though they otherwise met the contract specifications. Assuming that all appropriate defenses are seasonably raised, Will fixtures succeed in an action against druggists for breach of contract? A. Yes, because neither the July 15th agreement nor the August 1st agreement was required to be in writing. B. Yes, because the August 1st agreement operated as a waiver of the August 15th delivery term. C. No, because there was no consideration to support the August 1st agreement. D. No, because the parole evidence rule will prevent proof of the August 1st agreement. Take 10 seconds and make the best choice. The best choice here is B, yes, because the August 1st agreement operated as a waiver of the August 15th delivery term. The rule is that a party to a contract may indicate by words or conduct that she will not enforce a condition in the contract. Consideration is not required for a valid waiver of a condition. In this case, the original contract between Fixtures Inc. and Druggist required the five storage cabinets to be delivered on August 15th, but the parties orally agreed on August 1st to postpone the delivery date to August 20th. This August 1st agreement operated as a waiver of the August 15th delivery term, so Fixtures would succeed in any action against Druggist for a breach of contract. Question number nine. Current national statistics show a dramatic increase in the number of elementary and secondary school students bringing controlled substance to school for personal use or distribution to others. In response, Congress enacted a statute requiring state, each state legislature to enact a state law that makes it a state crime for any person to possess, use, or distribute within a thousand feet of an elementary or secondary school 
any controlled substance that has previously been transported in interstate commerce and that is not possessed, used, or distributed pursuant to a proper physician's prescription. This federal statute is A. Unconstitutional because Congress has no authority to require a state legislature legislature to enact any specific legislation. B. Unconstitutional because the possession, use, use, or distribution in close proximity to a school of a controlled substance that has previously been transported in interstate commerce does not have a sufficiently close nexus to such commerce to justify the regulation by Congress. C. Constitutional because it contains a jurisdictional provision that will ensure on a case-by-case basis that any particular controlled substance subject to the terms of the statute will, in fact, affect interstate commerce. D. Constitutional, because Congress possesses broad authority under both the General Welfare Clause and the Commerce Clause to regulate any activities affecting education that also have, in inseverable aggregates, a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Which do you think is the best answer? You have 10 seconds to choose. The correct answer here is A, unconstitutional, because Congress has no authority to require a state legislature to enact any specified legislation. Under the Tenth Amendment, all powers not granted to the United States nor, nor prohibited to the states are reserved to the states or the people. For this reason, Congress is prohibited from compelling state legislative or regulatory activity. Congress, however, can induce state action via strings on grants, but these conditions must be expressly stated and the conditions must relate to the purposes of the program. In this case, Congress enacted a statute requiring each state legislature to enact a state law that makes, it a, that makes a state crime for any person to possess or use or distribute within a thousand feet of a school a narcotic or controlled substance. That being said, the fact that the federal government is making the requirement of the law is where this situation falls afoul. Question number 10. Last one in this grouping. Plaintiff sued defendant for illegal discrimination, claiming that defendant fired him because of his race. At trial, plaintiff called witness, expecting him to testify that defendant had admitted the racial motivation. Instead, witness testified that defendant said that he had fired plaintiff because of his frequent absenteeism. While witness is still on the stand, plaintiff offers a properly authenticated secret tape recording he had made at a meeting with witness in which witness related defendant's admission of racial motivation. The tape recording is A. Admissible as evidence of defendant's racial motivation and to impeach witness's testimony. B. Admissible only to impeach witness's testimony. C. Inadmissible because it is hearsay not within any exception. Or D. Inadmissible because a secret recording is an invasion of a witness's right to privacy under the U.S. Constitution. Take 10 seconds and see if you can choose the best option. Best option is B, admissible only to impeach the witness's testimony. Hearsay is an out-of-court statement offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted in that statement. Hearsay is generally inadmissible because the declarant cannot be cross-examined when he speaks out of court. Under the federal rules of evidence, any party, including the party calling the witness, may attack the credibility of a witness. Prior inconsistent statements are admissible to impeach but inadmissible to prove the truth of the matter asserted if not given under oath. Here, obviously, we'd have the inability to have an oath as there is a recording. However, the recording could be used to impeach the witness. Hope you got this one right. We'll see you on our next grouping. Thank you again for joining us on Bar 10 Test Prep, where it's our goal to help you prepare for the bar exam. About 10 questions at a time, 10 questions per day. Please like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell so you can be updated every time we upload new content.